My name is Raul Flores. I am the public programmer and development officer at Doris. Welcome everyone to this wonderful event. Tonight we have the joy and the pleasure to have an emerging voice, an activist, a songwriter, a poet who is going to sing, who is going to sing um, a song that is called Story of a Woman. And it is a celebration of Ella Fitzgerald's time, achievements, and her life. With us, we have Ella Weil. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Can you guys hear me okay? I just, uh, okay. Hi, I'm Ella, um, and I'm going to sing a song that I wrote a few years ago specifically for this wonderful event that I have performed at for a few years now. Um, so, yeah. So many men lately have been making me feel some way, some way where I don't have a say about myself. They think they own me and they think they can control me as if I'd let them overrule my sense of self. You don't understand, you just don't understand how we got here and how we'll stay. How your view from up above us makes you look away. Walking with my head up, I won't look you in the eye till you realize that my worth is not determined by you. And you think you run the world now, but you can't even see how little girls are so much power over you you don't understand you still don't understand how we got here and how we'll change and we don't understand we'll never understand how your sense of power can make you so You say I'm just a kid, and yet you leave it to the children to rectify the things you did. Lock us in the basement now, take us down the line, all because we know our worth and want our rights. So many men lately have been making me feel this way. But I build myself to take the power from the pain. Mm -hmm. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, Ella. I, um, I share uh, her website on the chat if you want to learn more about that. Now I pass the torch to the Commissioner Pauline Tool. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. As Raul said, I am Pauline Tool, the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Records and Information Services. We hold, for those of you who don't know us, we hold city government's historical records dating from the colonial times to the present. Um, and we began this initiative last year, actually, with a uh, small exhibit at our location that Allison uh, curated uh, based on her work with the incorrigibles. We showed the film Push Out, uh, which documents the harsh treatment of young black women in schools, young black girls in schools. And um, we were going to do this big panel and then there was COVID. So here we are picking it up a year later. Um, and I'm really thankful that you all are here joining us. I'm going to deviate a little bit from my job. My chief job is to introduce Allison Cornyn but I wanna deviate by giving a huge shout out to my former colleague, Commissioner Gladys Carrion, who has devoted her lifetime to criminal justice, juvenile justice reform. So real big thank you uh, to you, Gladys. So um, on to Allison. Allison Cornyn is a force of nature. She imagines and creates projects that encourage viewers to challenge how we think about justice. As the director of the nonprofit Picture Project, she has developed innovative multimedia exhibits that explore the reality of justice and over incarceration. Let me give a few examples. Doggosh. A current project is the look back window that uses guerrilla stickering and other measures around New York State to increase awareness of the opportunity for victims of child sexual abuse to bring charges against their perpetrator um, up through August 14th of this year. So it's a very current, ongoing, very activist social engagement. Um, the Guantanamo Public Memory Project used an interactive online archive and a traveling exhibit, including display windows uh, at an NYU building at the sidewalk level to examine the century of history at Guantanamo Bay, including its current use holding detainees in the war on terror. States of Incarceration, funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, was a project with the New School and other universities that traveled to 20 locations and used mobile phones to collect responses and shared the collective experience of formerly incarcerated people to address the question, why and how did the United States become the world's largest prison? And then there is Incorrigibles which has lived several lives. Based on records from the New York Training School for Girls in Hudson, New York between 1904 and 1975, and source documents from the women who were sent there, each iteration of the exhibit explores anew the intersection of gender and criminal justice, class and race. Using the documents, interviews from former detainees, Allison, her, Allison and her partners have used the past to discuss our present state, which is tonight's topic. Allison teaches at several New York colleges, including Parsons School of Design, the School for Visual Arts, and the New School. A Br Brooklyn resident, she's a mom as well as an activist for social justice. So without any further remarks, I turn the discussion over to Allison. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Pauline, um, too, is a force of nature as are many of the, the people on this panel um, tonight. So, th so um, I, I wanted to thank, thank you for, for the, um, the invitation to have the Incorrigibles exhibition at the Municipal Archives and to invite us into the archives to see what we could unearth and what New York City has. Um, I want to thank Raul and Latanya and, and people behind the scenes at Doris for all the work that you've done you know, for this um, event and, and the exhibition and, and everything else. Um, Ella for your song, which is so moving every time I hear it, and, um, and for each of our panelists. Also for all of you who've chosen to spend your time with us this evening, um, we truly appreciate that. 
So Incorrigibles, as Pauline mentioned, it's a transmedia project that I've been working on for several years, and it does have, have lives, and, and there are, are quite a few collaborators that have been working on it as well. Uh, it, it really began with the witnessing of injustices faced by girls in the early 1900s, which led to a quest to find out what's changed and not in youth justice or the criminal legal system, as we call it, for girls and women. And really self-identifying girls and women, including LGBTQ and gender non-conforming people. So the question led me to, to meet each of these panelists who've de dedicated their lives to transforming the systems and imagining new ways to support, honor, and see girls and women especially girls and women of color who've historically and continually been marginalized and subject to racist and misogynistic violence, um, and who are each creating paths to resistance and resilience. So we're gonna watch a 13 minute film that gives a glimpse into some of the stories of young women's incarceration through the lens of the institution that Pauline mentioned here in New York, the New York State Training School for Girls that closed in 1975. It'll introduce us to some of the ways that language and power were abused and can be reimagined and reclaimed. Uh, we're graced tonight also by some of the women who were at the New York State Training School for Girls when they were young, who too are experts, survivors, and powerhouses. And we welcome them to share their wisdom, you know, if, if, if they feel at any point moved to do so. Um, also with us is Kathleen Hulser, the public historian for Incorrigibles, who you know, as, and, and many other people in the audience who could just as easily be on the panel. Um, so thank you all for, for being here. So as I was taught by my teenage daughter, who's a Zoom school expert, the video is gonna run better if everyone turns off their video, um, which you can find on the lower left of your screen, just while we watch the video. And, and you'll also be remain muted while we watch it. So I'm going to <laughs> mute myself and, and I will, I'll start the video. High heels and pantyhose, what does it matter I'm 12 years old? What does it matter to things I've seen more than most at 17? What does it matter that my eyes are black? Obviously I deserved that slap, or was it a kiss? I can't remember the cause of this. Perhaps I stood and then I fell and winded up in a grown-up hell. She was deemed incorrigible, and this of course always raises questions about what exactly is to be corrected. Wrong, I wasn't incorrigible. Interest. I had a mind of my own, the wanderer. If situations aren't right, it's time to go. That's a, uh, something I believe in today. If the situation isn't right, it's time to go. story begins with a box, sold at a yard sale in Hudson, New York. The box contained documents from the 1920s and 30s, personal photos and letters, news clippings, medical records, intake forms, and parole paperwork. All the contents had to do with girls. Girls as young as 12 who had been incarcerated at the New York State Training School for Girls, an institution that today we would call a youth prison. As I pieced together clues from the documents in the box, stories about individual girls revealed themselves. Anna Murphy, Lila Thomas, Sarah Greco, Jewel Ward, Dazzle, were charged with things like improper guardianship, being wayward, ungovernable, delinquent, disorderly, immoral, and incorrigible. The New York State Training School for Girls was the largest in the U.S. For the 70 years the training school was open, as many as 15,000 girls did time there, 600 at a time, staying for two or more years. These are some of their stories, our stories, through which we see them. December 28th in 1930, a young girl wrote to her mother, Dear Mother, I'm down here in Hudson for training. I don't know much about it because I got here only last night. 
but I like it so far. I played games and sewed last night. I have a beautiful room. There are 10 girls here with me, but in all over 400 girls. I hope you have a nice new year. How's Grandma and Gramps? With best wishes, your daughter, Gladys. 12-year-old Gladys had been the victim of a rape and forced marriage to a boarder in her home in Fulton County, New York. Her mother and mother's boyfriend, as well as the boarder, were charged with second-degree rape. Gladys was sent to the training school by authorities who labeled her a moral menace for trying to tell her story. In 1910, training school manager Annie Allen wrote, Our chief task and aim with delinquent girls is to protect them from the natural consequences of being girls. This trove of documents that had been spirited out of the institution led to a quest to find out more about these invisible girls. I put up a website and posted on social media. And people started to write in, asking for information or sharing stories about why their mothers, sisters, or aunts had been incarcerated at this training school. twelve, my mother was born. Around 1915, her mother takes off. Nobody has any explanation. She was there one day and she was gone. And my mother was, I think, five or six, and she is put on a train. Her ticket pinned to her jacket, she said, Norfolk, Virginia, is supposed to be an aunt. She goes to live with her, and this woman abused her terribly. After so many years, she's sent back to her grandparents' house to live. She had two brothers, and one of her brothers was a, a known pedophile. I don't know when she came back, if he assaulted her or what happened, but something happened on that farm that she went berserk. At that point, every, everything went crazy for her, and they take and put her in the juvenile hall. I adored my big sister. She began running away when she was 12 and I was six. My parents started saying, you know, if this keeps up, you know, just kind of normal, typical teenage acting out, smoking, running with guys, um, and, and then running away. They said she was wild. That was how they interpreted it. It wasn't, it, they didn't look at the way she was treated within the family. So they started threatening to send her away, and they sent her away when I was in the first grade. Women who had been committed to the training school when they were young wrote and wanted to tell their stories. So um, in 1968, my grandmother died, and that same year, my mother had tuberculosis. So she was hospitalized, and my father stopped coming home. It was February 6, 1969, when Mrs. Ellis from the Catholic Guardian Society came to 657 20th Street and took us all, like thieves in the night. They sent my oldest two sisters together. They sent the three boys together, but they sent me to a home all by myself. And I did not like it, so I rebelled. The judge said I was remanded because I was an incorrigible kid, and he sent me to Hudson State Training School for Girls. They put you on a bus, and you off you go, upstate somewhere. It was terrifying, terrifying to say the least. So they tried to make us be perfect little girls through fear and intimidation. And I became a person just like that. You know, I became a bully. I kind of became the label that they put on me. It was different cliques that you were with. Slick, sly, wicked, and wide. That was the name of our four group. We had to be hip, so I was slick. And um, Valerie Carson was Snooky, and then I forget her name, and her name is Yvonne. Like she was a very tall black girl who was pregnant, and that was the first time I ever seen a teenage pregnancy, and they took her baby. We were there because nobody wanted us, so our common bond was we felt rejected. We got a certain camaraderie from each other. I couldn't understand why nobody loved me. 
And then I began to act like a defect of character. Nobody loves me? Okay, fuck all you. And that's when I became, you know, crazy Lizzie. Dizzy Lizzie. It's not something I'm proud of now. I'm just letting you know, you know, the mindset. Because I could go back there in, in two minutes, how I felt. It took me a long, long time to understand that I'm not there anymore. But those feelings were just as real today as they were then. I grew up in Rochester, New York. I'm the oldest, and I'm the only one that went to reformatory school. I got sent away to Hudson, New York because I kept stealing. I was shoplifting, and I kept running away from home. I would run away a lot because my friends wanted to go to parties, and my mother did not play the house party scene. And I wasn't the type to talk back to my parents. I never, ever raised my voice. So my way of acting out was I would say I'm going to the store and just wouldn't come back. I had a loving home. I just was rebellious, and I just wanted to do what I wanted to do. One of the incidents that probably did send me up the river, I went to Learners with some friends of mine because I ran away in the dead of winter and didn't have a coat, so I stole the suede coat. But apparently they have a camera system, and I wasn't aware of that. So when they finally caught up with me and I was in court, they were talking about the incident at Learners, and I was like, well, I was never in Learners. They put the old videotape on, it was a black and white video, and it was me. And still I was in denial, oh, that's not me. And I meant that, you know, the judge wasn't having it, so he was fed up. I wasn't staying put, I wouldn't stop stealing. They decided the best thing for me was to go to a reformatory school. It wasn't like you dreaded being there, you just dreaded being locked up. Uh, we're doing a lot of punitive things to women and girls in the name of empowering them and treating their trauma. In the juvenile system, what you had was a, a rhetoric, at least in the early decades, of saving and protecting uh, kids, which then morphed into mass incarceration, of especially girls. We start in the 20s with sexual immorality and waywardness. Uh, and by the 50s and 60s, uh, we're getting person in need of supervision. So the language is changing, but the things that happen to the girls don't change. Intake records and interviews revealed that many girls had been physically or sexually abused. Why had they been sent away and not their abusers? These girls were living proof of transgressions by people in authority, living evidence that had to be silenced, punished, hidden. One of these incorrigible girls was the Ella Fitzgerald. Ella was sent to the training school in the 1930s for running away from her aunt and an abusive uncle. Her offense? Ungovernable and will not obey the just and lawful commands of her mother, a judged delinquent. The crime of being incorrigible sounds so antiquated, but it's still with us as a box to be checked on intake forms. In the current DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, we now have Oppositional Defiant Disorder. A disorder in a child marked by defiant and disobedient behavior to authority figures. Sometimes. ...account and structured memory of the injustices of the past can shed light on the present and prevent the injustices of the future. Thirty years after the last incorrigible girl, left the training school in 1975. Girls from a group home and an after-school program came together for a workshop. After conducting their own archival research and hearing stories of girls before them, they reframed words used then and now to define young women. Not wild, they said. Free. Not unruly. Proud. Not defiant. Strong not wayward, a survivor, not delinquent, courageous, not disobedient, determined, incorrigible, yes, out of it.
I didn't play the credits um, because we're because for the sake of time, but I really wanted to shout out to the young women who took part in the the workshop in Hudson from the group home and the and Operation Unite in, in Hudson, as well as the women and family members who shared their stories that really um, you know developed the the video and and this whole project, and also to Lisa Durfee in the New York State Archives for the trove of archival documents that really spurred this work on. So. We're going to go to um, to hear from our panelists, and um, and you each offer a very different vantage point on the issues um, impacting girls and women in the criminal legal system. We've got a research activist and nonprofit professional, a project director for Program to End Girls Incarceration, the former head of a juvenile justice agency at the state and local level and a founder whose mission it is to help disenfranchised women transition back into society. So rather than me introducing you more than that, would, I'd like each of you to spend a few minutes to introduce yourselves and to talk about your work. So maybe Lindsay, could you, um, could you start, please? Sure, thank you everyone for being here and thank you Allison for inviting me to speak. Um, every time I see the film, I hear new things in it and I'm always so excited to, to talk, but I'm gonna stay brief and um, just talk a little bit about our national work. So as Allison said, I'm Lindsay Rosenthal, I'm the project director of the initiative to end girls incarceration at the Vera Institute. Vera is a nonprofit technical assistance provider working across the country to end mass incarceration. And our project is focused on completely eliminating the incarceration of girls in both short-term and long-term facilities in the juvenile justice system by 2030. Um, and we're currently working in five sites. Um, we focus on ending girls incarceration because the reality is that girls should not be incarcerated. Um, the overwhelming majority of girls who are incarcerated are incarcerated on misdemeanors and status offenses nationally. Um, they're incarcerated because of circumstances rooted in experiences of violence, trauma, and discrimination that have gone overlooked and unaddressed. There's about 42,000 detentions of girls 10 and older each year across the United States. And many of them are held in correctional facilities that mirror adult prisons and jails that are designed for punishment and isolation that are the opposite of what girls and young people need to heal. Um, and this impacts girls of color, especially Black and Native American and Latinx girls. Um, in 2018, Black girls constituted approximately 40% of detention admissions nationally, even though they're just 12% of the general population in the United States. And um, although there's been a lot of successful juvenile justice reform across the country that has driven down the population of youth by more than half over the last 10 years, racial disparities have actually increased with reform. And Black girls are now the fastest growing segment of the juvenile justice population they receive more severe dispositions than their peers at every point in the juvenile justice system. LGBT youth are also overrepresented in the girls' side of the justice system. So 40% of kids in girls' units nationally identify as LGBT GNC compared to 13% of the general population. And they're disproportionately survivors of sexual violence, which you heard in the film. So uh, more than 80% of girls in the juvenile justice system have experienced sexual abuse, and that's compared to about 20% in the general population, to give you a sense. Um, and the circumstances that are bringing girls in are complex, but they have to do with enforcement of gender norms and biases that criminalize girls of color who are not seen as victims of abuse, who are seen as more culpable than their white peers but also policing girls' behavior, um, girls who buck the norm in terms of who they date, how they express themselves, how they dress, um, often find themselves confined. And that history is, as Allison's work has shown so clearly, um, is, runs deep. And, and, and as recently as the 1970s, um, there was a status offense law on the books in New York State that applied to girls until their 18th birthdays, but to boys only until they turned 16. Um, so I think, you know, just to, just to keep it succinct, because I think there's a lot we can dive into on the panel, um, when it comes to how, you know, the roots of early policing of gender norms and criminalization of girls for experience of sexual abuse show up today. 
But I also want to focus on the fact that when we say ending in girls incarceration, it's because we believe it's actually possible and because there are jurisdictions that are actually taking the initiative to do it. As I said earlier, we have five sites who have actually committed to getting to zero and where we're seeing a lot of progress. And, you know, I think this work, we're so lucky to have Gladys Cadion on this panel um, because she, our first site was in New York City. And without her leadership, we wouldn't have been able to launch an initiative in New York City focused on ending incarceration and committing to that bold goal. Um, and, you know, Gladys, I think one of my favorite stories about her is our first, we have a task force in New York City that guides reform that includes all the key leaders that are needed to um, reduce the population of young people in custody. And Gladys came to the first meeting in 2017, which was right after the Women's March, or, and she was uh, knitting a pink hat in the corner of the room <laughs> while we were having this meeting. Um, I think just showing the depth of her leadership and her passion for the change um, that we're all trying to make for girls across the country. Um, while she was the leader of ACS, um, we uh, were able to do a case file review and release about half the girls that were in custody. Numbers haven't gone back up since then. So just to give you a sense of what the change that has taken place in terms of numbers of girls who are incarcerated in New York City, since we launched the task force in partnership with Gladys, we launched it in 2017. And at that time, um, there were about 475 admissions of girls into detention. Uh, last year, that was only 144 girls admitted to juvenile detention. So that's a 70% drop. And on any given day, there hasn't been more than two or three girls in custody in the detention side. And then in close to home, when we started this work, there were 52 girls in the long-term placement facilities in New York City. And that dropped down to just five new admissions last year into close to home. So that's a 90% reduction. And citywide right now, there's only three youth um, in girls juvenile detention units and nine in the longer term detention facilities. Um, so we're getting close, it's within reach. And the numbers that New York City has incarcerated today in a city of 8 million people are comparable um, to the numbers that you see in smaller states um, in like Maine and Hawaii, um, and even lower than you know many, many states that have higher numbers despite having a much lower population. And so we can you know, dive more into that data and I can share some more data in the, in the chat for those of you who are interested in learning more about the numbers. Um, but I think you know, that just gives you an overview of our work and um, really excited to be in conversation with the rest of the panelists today. Uh, Allison, uh, I have to shout out for you for your leadership and your tenacity and making this happen and once again, giving voice to young people, to young women. Uh, and Lindsay, thank you for being a wonderful partner. I am the former commissioner, both uh, at the state level for the agency, the Office of Children and Family Services, responsible for the administration for both child welfare uh, and juvenile justice. And I have to say that child welfare, I've always said, is the front door you know, for the juvenile justice system. Uh, and I, you know, and I say this, that there, we capture these young people and particularly girls into these systems and we have a hard time letting them go. Um, I was state commissioner for seven years. And during that time, I worked really hard to try to elevate uh, the presence of girls and the voice of girls in our work. And really, you know, girls are invisible in these systems. They're invisible for a variety of reasons. And in the state of New York, that was the case also. Uh, our focus, these systems are designed for boys. Um, and so all the programming, uh, the policies and the design is geared to boys and we forget about girls. Um, and so it was my responsibility and to really give voice to girls, to really rethink how our approach to having girls there, but most important, I have to tell you in my work at the state, is really dismantling that system and closing facilities and reducing the number of girls and reducing the number of young people coming into the system and investing in community programs, realizing that these systems cause harm. Uh, so certainly at that time, 
uh, I was commissioner from 2007 to 2014 at the state, it was very controversial. But um, I'm very proud of that work that we did and what has happened since, because we have reduced the footprint of that system tremendously. I then transitioned to the city to run uh, close to home, uh, which was an initiative that we started at the state uh, to allow New York City to create its own juvenile justice system. Uh, and I came in as the commissioner of ACS to lead that effort. Uh, I would, I, one note and one statistic that, that Lindsay didn't share is in New York now is responsible, New York State now is responsible for the secure system in the state. So New York City is responsible for the non-secure, we call non-secure and limited secure system uh, for young people. And the state continues to have the responsibility for the secure system. So I looked the other day for the stats and how many girls we have in New York State in the secure system from New York City. And that number as of December of 2020 was zero. And so I'm, you know, uh, was surprised and very, very pleased. We worked really hard to transform uh, those facilities that served girls and to make policy changes and practice changes that reflected the needs of girls. In New York, we came to, when I came to New York City to run the New York City system, had the opportunity to partner with some wonderful people, including Lindsay and Vera, to really elevate the voice of girls. And I remember our first conference that we had, which was titled Girls Matter and really trying and bringing community-based organizations and advocates and judges and scholars together to really have a conversation about how we serve girls better. How do we create programs in communities? You know, how do we reduce that footprint? And I remember at that time, we had five girls. We had five girls in the system. And I said, Jesus, we really do. We really need to have these, have these girls incarcerated, have five girls, we could wrap our arms around these girls. Why do we continue to confine them, to incarcerate them, uh, and tremendous trauma and harm that we cause these young women? And you know, and today, and so we, our number, our footprint is reduced. I would love to have zero right now in the city. We only have three girls. Um, but I'll tell you that, you know, state, it costs it up to $900,000 a year to house and confine a young person in the state of New York. Let's just imagine what we could do with $900,000 a year per girl, even now, you know, $27 million, right? It's, a, it's, a, you know, it's almost a million dollars, right? Think about the $3 million that these three girls represent and what we can do with $3 million. And New York City has just a while back launched a program where they invested $2.5 million in communities to meet the needs of girls and girls programming. So my work has been dedicated to dismantling these systems that cause tremendous harm and investing in communities and bringing people together to really understand how we better serve girls and all young people. And it's not through incarcerating. And so together, we have been reimagining our systems. And um, I, I'm really very happy to be here and to learn from all of you about the work that's been ongoing. So thank you, Allison. Thank you, Gladys. Um, Shonda, can you introduce yourself, please? Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Allison, thank you for having me. Um, and for creating the space to have this really important conversation and to have it with some of my favorite people. <laughs> so, you know, that's a treat in and of itself. Um, I'll keep my intro a little brief so that we uh, have time to be in the meat of the conversation. Because our positionality matters, I like to start these conversations by telling you a little bit about who I am beyond what it is I do. Um, I come to the conversation with a host of identities that are relevant to our discussion about incorrigibility. Um, I identify as a fat, queer, black woman from a Southern working class family background. I've been directly impacted by many systems, uh, the justice system among them, as a youth and as an adult. And I identify as a survivor of sexual violence. 
I have two young children um, who should be commended for raising a, an unruly, misbehaved, incorrigible parent like myself. Um, all of those things led me to this work and all of these things inform my orientation to the work and they make my connection to these uh, issues very personal, not theoretical at all. Um, over the past decade or so, my personal and, and professional work has attempted to address uh, inequity and injustice broadly with a focus on centering the needs and the experiences of marginalized people, girls of color in particular. And I've done that in a variety of capacities, um, including research, uh, advocacy, and now by directing a major uh, national philanthropic initiative. Um, in my current capacity as director of the Girls of Color Initiative at the Ms. Foundation for Women, uh, one of uh, the nation's first public women's foundations, uh, my work attempts to address uh, the multitude of inequity faced by girls of color and gender expansive youth in the U.S. by providing grant making, uh, leadership development, and capacity building resources to support their advocacy and their movement building. Topeka? This conversation is incredibly important to me. So my name is Topeka Sam. I'm the founder and executive director of the Leaves of Hope Ministries. Um, the organization was birthed during my incarceration in federal prison. Uh, we focus to end poverty and incarceration of women and girls. We address that through two buckets. One is direct service and sustainability, and the other is policy and advocacy. Uh, what we know is that we cannot end incarceration if we do not address the root issues to systemic racism poverty and the inequities of people of color uh, centered specifically on women and girls. Um, we also know that there's traumas, traumas that were unhealed and the traumas that were unhealed need to be healed through holistic approaches, not only through um, programming, but also through love. Um, and through love, we also provide safe housing, safe housing for girls. Um, we've had girls as young as 16, um, up to the age of 24. And with this approach, we have adult women as well as younger women together building community. Um, and, and often it, it, it heals because there's mothers who miss their daughters and the girls who need their mothers. And there's a process through that. Um, additionally, um, the organization we're scaling throughout the country. Presently, I'm in Miami, which is why I'm in the airport and couldn't make it. Um, but what I've found, um, Miami, Baltimore, Maryland, um, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, outside of New York where we are in the Bronx, that the number um, of girls being criminalized, put into prisons or baby jails, as many call them, um, homeless victims of sex trafficking or because they don't have safe places to go um, in organizations that have lived the same experiences that they am are leading. So as Shonda said, um, I'm happy to be here, Allison. Thank you for the invitation. Sorry if there's background noise, I'm doing the best that I can. Um, but I am here and um, I'm grateful to see many of the people that I love so dear. And thank you, Lindsay, for the in-depth uh, information that you gave us at the beginning. I'm grateful because I had a whole slew of notes of numbers that I didn't have to do. So that's great. So I appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you, Topeka. And really thank you to all the panelists because you ever you are like Topeka so busy in the airport, you know, to be able to be with us tonight. It's really so appreciated. Uh, before uh, there's questions for each of you, but but just kind of jumping back to the the language in the film. Does anyone want to talk about incorrigible as a word? Is it still used to describe girls? So absolutely, absolutely. Um, and there are a lot of organizational partners out there that are working really hard to make sure that we stop using incorrigibility um, as a word. Uh, we know that um, in the, the, the term sort of at least implicitly sort of singles out um, girls of color for not meeting uh, middle class gender norms. And, and, uh, uh, so, and not only does the term single out girls of color for not meeting these sort of expectations of, of stereotypical feminine behavior, it specifically punishes girls of color in particular for not living up to norms that are by definition just impossible for them to um, one of the things that we know is that our 
conceptions of acceptable womanhood are really deeply rooted in Victorian era or moral standards that espouse things like restraint, um, piety, purity, and domesticity, and above all submissiveness. And these values not only determine who would be deemed a true woman and who was not, but it also informs our thinking about what sort of behaviors ultimately are deemed criminal um, and which type of women are, are, are worthy of our protection. Um, at the same time, uh, very negative images and stereotypes about women of girls of color exist to, um, to justify our racial oppression, our sexual objectification, and our economic exploitation. Um, and these representations really uh, exist in direct opposition uh, to white middle class gender norms, and they're designed to make us think that we're broken, um, to make us think that racism, sexism, and, and poverty are natural, normal, and ultimately inevitable. And that um, at the heart of, of some of these representations of Black women and girls is, is the idea that we're innately uh, deviant, um, that we're hypersexual, um, that we're hostile and aggressive, and thus uh, failed, unfixable, and bad beyond re repair, and ultimately incorrigible. Um, I've been thinking a lot lately about uh, women and girls and incarceration um, uh, and women and girls broadly, but specifically the ways that women and girls of color are punished for what uh, I call being failed women, per se, um, and specifically for behaviors that would otherwise be considered laudable or, for, or, 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 or categorized, categorized as uh, resistance. Um, but the way that we lock uh, women and girls up and throw them away sends a really strong message uh, to them, but to all women um, that resistance to oppression will not only not be rewarded or tolerated, it will be punished um, with whatever level of brutality necessary. And I think that's important for sort of all of us who are, are interested in, in, in sort of equality to be thinking about how we treat specifically um, uh, people who are impacted by the justice system. Thank you, Shonda. And I think uh, in, in relation to what you were talking about, um, the term incorrigible is, uh, was just passed. There was a, a bill in the Senate, Senate Bill S-2737, that was just passed by the Assembly, and it was previously passed by the Senate, and it, so it's going to be going to Governor Cuomo's desk to strike the word incorrigible as a subcategory of pins because of, of how it's, it's used much more to single out girls of color. And um, and and because of the connotation that it means that that um, that that somebody who's incorrigible is unredeemable and and so so I think I'm glad that the legal system is is going to be transforming it. The Girls for Gender Equity is an amazing organization that's really been pushing for this um, for for some years and it's happening, but. Um, but I also think the idea, the reclaiming the, 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 the word itself is also, I think, an important thing to, um, to think about kind of in, individually. So Shonda, you kind of, you were addressing uh, in some ways the question that I was about to ask you. So I don't know if you want to add to this because um, one of the quotes in the film was by the author of How to Save Girls, a woman writing in 1910, she was a board of managers and, and the quote was, it, um, the chief task with delinquent girls is to protect them from the natural consequences of being girls. And that's quite a statement. So I think in the, in the context of Me Too and Time's Up, and we're having a renewed conversation about some of the natural consequences of being a girl or woman today. And so girls' incarceration in the early courts was very much about enforcing sexism and social control of girls, including lesbian, bi, and gender nonconforming girls. So does girlhood look different for girls and women of color or gender nonconforming youth of color? And what are some of the natural consequences of being a girl of color today? And um, in your work, how do you see that these natural consequences either lead to their justice or legal involvement or complicate their experience in the justice system? For me, that's, that question is uh, simple and complex at the same time. Um, we know that cisgender, uh, transgender, non-binary and queer girls and girls of color really do live at the intersection of many systems of oppression. Um, and we also know that they face tremendous uh, social and structural barriers, including things like disturbing patterns of policing in their schools and communities, um, and barriers to educational achievement, uh, reproductive justice, economic opportunity, and political equality. And if that weren't enough, we know that they are recipients of deeply embedded uh, racial and gender biases in the media 
and public policy, philanthropy, and research. Um, however, one of the most insidious of these so-called natural consequences is violence. Um, and all forms of violence, but sexual violence especially, uh, some research suggests that about 60% of girls generally, um, of black girls generally, will have some sort of coercive sexual contact before the age of 18. And for women and girls impacted by the justice system, that number is like 85%. In my own life, in my sort of, in, 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 in my own lived experience, that number is way higher. Yeah. Um, and sort of uh, connected to, uh, you know, the biases that, that girls of color experience, as I was talking about before, uh, viewing girls of color, even unconsciously, um, as innately sexual, um, as aggressive, beings uh, likely at best results in their being subjected to harsher discipline and punishment. However, at worst, it creates a justification for the violence they face um, in schools and communities and at the hands of biased system actors. Um, it, it pushes them in, into what researchers like uh, Lindsay, who's on our call, have described as the sexual abuse to prison pipeline girls of color who face intersectional oppression are historically viewed as deviant, um, um, innately sexual and aggressive, which in turn influences our opinion of them as more adult. And then that consequently makes them more vulnerable to sexual violence. However, because we view them um, as adult and more culpable for their behaviors, our response to that victimization is not protection. Um, it's further victimization at the hands of biased system actors um, policies and practices, and uh, this at least partly explains their over-representation in the juvenile justice system. So Gladys, I have a question for you. So you've worked uh, extensively throughout your career, first at the state level and then at the local level to reduce the number of kids in confinement, including girls. You've also operated programs specifically for girls before shifting into your role in government. So can you walk us through some of the key challenges or the key changes that you work to implement at the state and city level focused on reducing confinement as well as the challenges? And what progress have we made for girls in, in recent years and what obstacles still remain in recognizing needs and um, addressing them in the community? You know, there was a recognition um, when I became commissioner in the state that, that the juvenile justice system was a broken system. Um, and I focused in closing facilities and reducing the systems and, and really narrowing that pipeline into the system, narrowing that front door, um, which, you know, we, we must also include, you know, foster care and the, the child welfare system that causes, that captures so many more children and young people into that system and causes great harm and really is a front door to the juvenile justice system. Um, and so faced with the challenges of a system that was declared by the Department of Justice as broken, as violating the constitutional rights of young people, there was only one strategy. And for me, that strategy was closing as much of that system as I could and really trying to divert and channel money into investments into the community. But while young people and girls in particular were being confined in the state, I felt a real responsibility to improve the conditions of confinement until we can continue through investments in community and alternatives to detention and placement to provide uh, for the needs of, of these young people. And particularly for girls, you know, we had, we. You know, as I said before, the girls were invisible. Our policies didn't address the needs of the girls. Even the girls' facilities did not have the proper training for staff, didn't have the policies, did not recognize the research uh, about girls and what the girls needed, and certainly did not include girls in the part of the planning process and in informing what their needs were and including them. Um, in making decisions about what worked best for them, not including families in these conversations. And the length of stay was much longer than from boys. So one of the, my objectives was really increasing their visibility of really having an agency that recognized the need to capture statistics um, on gender, to really understand what the health needs of the young girls were, uh, having health screens that looked at uh, sexual reproduction, the trauma. You know, my experience before I got into government and I ran in Woodhouse that served girls in a maternity residence was that 
98% of the girls that came into the system and came into our program had experienced sexual violence. You know, were victims um, of a tremendous violence in their lives, of trauma, totally unaddressed. Um, and so really trying to ha create a system that looked at trauma and responded to trauma and really treated girls differently. It's a system, as I said before, designed for boys. And because the number of girls was much smaller, so we paid no attention to girls. And that was the honest truth, we paid no attention. So my responsibility was to make sure that not only did we close that front door, not only did we speak about creating programs in community, also the recognition that my entire system was black and brown, because that's who we incarcerated, not only in New York State, but across the country. That's who we incarcerate. Um, and that was black and brown and recognize the disparity inherent in this system. And quite frankly, as much as I changed, I wasn't gonna change enough that I would ever say that this system serves the needs of any child, uh, including girls. Um, so yes, there were policy changes. Yes, that, that we, we trained, uh, we include, included the voice of families and, and young people. But you know, I say this today and I said it then, it was never enough. We should not be incarcerating any, any young person and certainly not girls. The research shows that they don't pose a risk to public safety. We ignore the research. These systems ignore the research, ignore what works and in, ignores community voices. And so, when, so that's, that was the work that I tried to do with the state and work with advocates, work with community programs and, and, and really try to invest in them and to divert as many young people as I could, and particularly girls. When I moved to the city, I continued that work. Um, you know, and, and I, I will say that while I had some success, I, you know, I wasn't able to, to do as much as necessary to make a difference in the lives of these young people. And my strategy, and today, you know, my work um, at, at the Columbia Justice Lab is really to close all youth prisons across this country. I co-chair the Youth Correctional Leaders for Justice, which is a group of 57 current and, and prior uh, retired system leaders who are committed to closing youth prisons, committed to speaking about the harm that we cause, about the racial disparity and who we incarcerate in this country. And we continued this work while I was in the city. And I'm really you know, proud to say that we have reduced the number of young people coming into the system. We incarcerate very few young people in the city of New York, as Lindsay was able to share in his statistics. But you know what? We're still incarcerating young people. And so that needs to stop. And we need to really reimagine how justice should look and who really should be running, uh, creating this new iteration of what justice should look like in, in this state and in this country. Uh, and it's and and we can do it, um, and so that's the work that I did while I was at the state in the city. Um, the statistics show that we were able, and if you could do it in New York, you could do it anywhere else. But the city, to, you know, to reduce the number of, of of young people in confinement. But the city of New York continues to build on that. My work with Vera and in, in creating this task force has led to recommendations. Uh, that are being implemented by the city, that for the first time, really, we're building a, a body of work of programs and investments in girls, run by community-based organizations in partnership with community, in partnership with girls, and giving voice to them, which is really important. So it, for me, it took too long to do, very impatient, uh, but it really is the right path, and I'm very, very happy that New York has managed to do this and that there continues to be leadership uh, to enhance our work with girls. Thank you, Gladys. And that's a great segue to my question for Lindsay, which is uh, through your research and programmatic work, you've seen firsthand what girls' experiences are with the justice system today and are bringing together diverse groups of stakeholders to end girls' incarceration, which is kind of what Gladys was talking about. Um, that was beginning in 2017. So how does what was documented in the past look similar or different than what you're seeing today? And would you please share some of the successes of your work and what still needs to be done? I mean, Shonda, I think said 
better than anyone could sort of where where our notions of um, white middle class gender norms and and the legacy of racism and sexism in the United States um, show up today and inform all of the reasons why girls and LGBT youth end up in the justice system and particularly LGBT youth of color. Um, you know, but your work, Allison, has documented, you know, how uh, one of the things that made girls incorrigible historically is, is my, as far as my layman's understanding of historical research, I'm not a historian, historian is that um, girls were, were criminalized for enticing men to rape them, right? Um, because they're, they're, they were seen as Shonda said as sexually deviant and somehow uh, failed and, and encouraging men to harm them. And we still across this country um, criminalize girls of color uh, for directly for their experiences of violence. And when we go into work in new systems, we still, um, it's not uncommon to have probation officers still use the language of saying, uh, sh she's out there getting herself trafficked again. So that's why we need to violate probation, right? And it's the, it's completely flipped where the accountability lies and girls are held accountable for the entire system of racism and sexism that contextualizes their lives. Um, and too often the people that harm them are not held accountable. And I think we, we've mentioned girls for gender equity in this room. And one of the things that's come out of the New York City task force that I'm um, proudest of is New York City has for the first time a diversion program that is specifically for girls and gender expansive youth of color. It's called Just Us. It's run by Girls for Gender Equity and it's STEPS Rising Ground. Um, and that program is about um, investing in girls' leadership and well being as a strategy for diversion and recognizing their leadership. So, Girls for Gender Equity does organizing work with the girls as a diversion strategy, um, names and helps them learn about the harms that they've experienced and develop strategies with them to disrupt it. Um, I think too often girls are blamed for the trauma they've experienced and the problem is located in them and our only response is therapy or behavioral modification. And, in, and we don't pay attention to the economic drivers that make the girls vulnerable to violence in the first place often. They don't have housing, which Topeka works on. They don't have you know, basic income that they need. And so this program pays the girls um, stipends so that their basic needs are met while they're working on their own healing and locates the problem of girls incarceration appropriately in the structures around girls rather than just in their own individual choices um, and supports them in accessing the basic needs that they need to stay out of the system and hopefully avoid being further criminalized. Um, and so I think that that model of programs that invest in girls' leadership, girls' well-being, girls' healing, um, of shifting resources to organizations in the community that have a strong anti-racist, anti-sexist practice and can actually hold space for girls is what's actually needed. So when Gladys talks about $900,000 a year, what could we be paying for instead? How many more? I mean, Girls for Gender, that diversion program uh, it's about, about, it's about $800,000 a year and it's serving, you know, tens and tens of girls each year. That's just for the cost of incarcerating one girl. So what could we do if, you know, if we actually got to zero and reinvested those resources? And that's why, you know, we were grateful for Gladys's leadership and she started a movement nationally and other systems are trying to copy you know, what New York City has done. And so we're hoping to continue to help systems dismantle, close down, and reinvest into these community-based solutions that girls need. And you answered one of the questions that, that um, was in the, the chat asking about what, if someone, if you could describe the best, divert, one of the best diversionary programs. So thank you. Uh, so Topeka, I was going to ask you, I had two questions for you. One of them was, was really about this legacy of trauma, which has been addressed um, somewhat. And you can speak about it if, if you'd like. But I also, if anyone has a link to the, 
the report that was done by the Georgetown Law Center, the Human Rights Project for Girls, and the Ms. Foundation that Lindsay was part of, the Sexual Abuse to Prison Pipeline, the girls' story, if you could put it in the chat, that would be great. It's a really important report, I, I think, about the, 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 the painful American tale of, of sexual abuse and, and, and other forms of trauma that are predictors of girls' and women's entry into the criminal legal system. Um, so if you want, you can talk, you can, you can address that, but let's talk about HOPE and, and, and um, Ladies of Hope Ministry and, and HOPE House, because you're, as an advocate for prison reform and the rights of incarcerated women, you've established an amazing resource to provide women released from prison with the tools to move forward in their, in their lives, Ladies of Hope Ministries. And your advocacy has allowed you to attract substantial financial support from a hedge fund to expand Ladies of Hope um, and into other communities. So in your vision, how can government and nonprofits um, such as yours transform the lens landscape of women and justice and girls and justice? And what does that look like? I think Lindsay and Shonda actually went ahead and already addressed the other question. So I'm not gonna add anything to that. Actually, I'm coming to an end, but just around um, first, like how do we support girls? For me, it's the same way you support women. Right? You empower them on how they how do you do it. Um, through our six programs, one of them we have is called Faces of Women in Prison. And we train women and girls on you know how to stand up for themselves and know it's a, it's a complete sentence, um, you know, how they can ask people for support and help, and then really how do they share their stories? How they share them in a way that's gonna change policy and activate people to change. And we actually make sure that people get paid while they're doing that. And this goes to the girls too. And so often, you know, women are traumatized um, and they're reliving their trauma when they're explaining about the experiences that they've gone through, but there is no support. And so they get off, they have to unpack, they have to figure out what they're going to do. Um, and then either for the girls, they have to find out, you know, how to get to school the next day, some young mothers, what are they going to do with their children, um, or even worse, right? How are they going to feed themselves? How are they going to find some women? In? And so we created a speaker's hub where women and girls, after they go through the training, they're um, put up there, and anytime someone wants to hire a speaker, they can go right there. We have a speaker's coordinator that help them there. Um, as it relates to funding from government, um, ladies of Home Ministries, we actually haven't applied for any government, federal, state, um, or city funding. Part of that was because as a directly affected woman, um, and understanding the systems that are already in place, I didn't want to uh, build an organization that was dependent upon another system that could potentially cause more harm. For example, when you um, put an RFP or you get money from the Department of Corrections, there's different um, audiences and things that they automatically get just so they can come um, into the house. There's things that you have to go through. And when sisters are already on probation and parole, um, you don't want to cause any further anxiety or any further trauma just to get a dollar. And so for me, uh, strategically, it was really, you know, what foundations, what corporations, uh, what other individuals that understand that those of us who are directly affected, we have the solutions uh, because we lived the experience, we've had successful reentry, we've transformed our lives, and um, we've been successful in doing that. And you know, once you kind of get in the door and you meet one person, then they introduce you to other people, and that is just what our strategy was. We partnered with um, Third Point, which is a hedge fund and marketing and Daniel Lowe Foundation on the foundation side for the funding, getting all of the structure um, for the organization around capacity building, um, making sure all of our um, like data and analytics are together because as everyone on this call knows that we've heard Lindsay so eloquently put everything out, often when you're a small organization, um, you don't even know what, where to begin the research because you're doing the work on the ground and you don't have the resources in order to do that. So we're able to tap into that We've been able to um, build relationships with like J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, we're building a digital bank for women and girls so that they have access to finances and resources um, while even in school and incarcerated. Uh, we've partnered with um, many different companies that are unlikely bedwork fellows to make sure that we're doing um, cooperative plans where people actually not only are getting funding, for us as an organization, we're getting funding. We're getting these corporations to sponsor our women and girls, whether it's through high school and onto college. So, you know, I think um, 
the way government, for me, as I've been on these you know, different calls with the feds and others to talk about how funding works, um, I've, I've, I've recommended that, you know, potentially every time a, a larger organization or foundation gets funding, that they make sure that they have to uh, provide additional funding to community-based organizations through their grant and the regranting process. But often it's very, very difficult for small organizations to really enter into government contracts because the things that are required are really um, outside of the purview when you're your budgets are small and you don't have that type of support. So I had other questions, but I think I would love to open it up uh, to the Q&A to, to people in, in, um, who've joined us tonight. If anyone wants to um, put a question in the chat or raise their hand. Hi, my name is Sharon Anderson and I was in that video that they showed. I was at Hudson um, School for Girls for about almost two years <laughs> and um, while I was there I spent the majority of my time trying to run away so I didn't really want to be there but um, I'm glad Allison is having this um, I met a lot of young women there well they weren't even women we were all girls I met a lot of girls that did a lot of things that I didn't know little girls did <laughs> you know, because I was so sheltered. I, I'm kind of shy. I just want to say hello to everybody. <laughs> but I, I would like, I, we, have to, we have to put in, in the, the link for your acting career um, so in, in the chat as well so people can follow you because you have done amazing things since you've, you've been out of there too. And, and, um, and Sharon is also a comedian and, and, um, and she's hilarious. So we'll, we'll include some thank of you. that. And thank you for, for, um, for being here, Sharon. And for being in the- Thank you. I think people might wanna know what they can do to help end girls' incarceration or kind of refocus the, the attention on, on, on rebuilding the community and or addressing needs. Um, does anyone have thoughts about how, how people could get involved? You know, I, I jump in and say that one concrete way is to really make contributions to community-based organizations that are working in community, to help to raise funds, to volunteer, and to mentor young women. You know, there's a tremendous need for, for that, not only money, because, you know, as we just heard, um, it's really hard to raise money um, to really fund programs. And... But more importantly, it's really important to show young women that we care and volunteering to be a mentor, to work, you know, to volunteer in a community organization is accessible to everyone. And I would urge you not only to make contributions, but to invest your time and love for these young women. I can add on to that really quickly. And first of all, Gladys, anytime you ever just pick up the mic and I'm, I'm always like, yep, but Gladys said it. Um, so I just want to shout you out. So I'm like, yep, mm -hmm. we're glad I said, we're glad I said, glad I said the answers. Um, so, you know, what I'll, what I'll contribute will be minimal to follow, um, but, you know, I have a few things. Um, I think uh, one thing that we can do is stop being afraid to name that this is a thing that's specifically happening to Black girls, specifically happening to Black girls, specifically happening to Black girls. We say things like girls of color as a political solidarity term to know that, you know, this is something that happens sort of at the sort of continuum and uh, of, of sort of um, when we think about our proximity to whiteness and our proximity to blackness, um, you know, there, there are those poles and there are the things that happen in, to everybody in between. But this is specifically something that happens to black girls for being black girls. And I think that we have to not be afraid to name that. And I feel like it's something um, that we are, we're timid about. We've been timid around race and we've been timid around sort of naming that thing. So I think that that is a big thing. Um, and to sort of be comfortable with the discomfort of that. Um, uh, and indigenous girls, you know, something that happens to black and indigenous girls, but it's definitely related to our proximity to blackness and our uh, proximity to whiteness. Um, I also think like, Lifty, like Lindsay lifted up is to sort of change our unit analysis from locating the problem um, with girls to, um, to, to, to actually sort of understanding all of the, inequ the inequities that are happening in our communities um, that are landing on girls. 
um, and that are landing on girls for a whole multitude of, of reasons, of a whole multitude of intersectional reasons. Um, I think that we can do things like think about how to support mothers. I've heard it said that there's no such thing as a child, right? Because child, they just don't come out, you know, they're, they're connected to somebody, they're connected to parents, they're connected to families, and they're sort of nested in communities. And so if ultimately what we want to do is um, impact girls, then we need to be directing solutions at the entire context um, in which they live and grow. Otherwise, it's like flawed from the inception. You cannot come and give some diversion program to a girl and think that, um, you know, next week everything is fine and she's never going to come back because all the things that pushed her into the justice system still are there and we're not addressing those things. Um, so, yeah, and then lastly, I would say that we probably start to have to expand our conception of carcerality um, to uh, beyond just uh, the criminal justice system to the family justice system. Um, and I know this is something that, um, that Lindsay and team do um, uh, uh, with the uh, initiative to end girls incarceration is to think about the ways in which uh, the, the family justice system pushes girls into the system, but it also constitute, uh, constitutes another form of criminalization and surveillance. And once uh, youth enter the system, once families enter the system, they have more of a likelihood to find themselves attached to the criminal justice. So those are a few things. Yeah, I think everything that Shonda and Gladys said, plus I think, you know, part of not being timid around race and sexism is understanding, as Shonda said, that criminalization happens on a spectrum and it happens in different places and not just in the juvenile justice system. So we should be really curious about what's happening in our kids' school um, to push kids out, what's happening in the youth center that our kids go to, if there's a fight, are the police called or is there some other way of dealing with that? Like, I think all of us as individual community members can be really curious about the institutions that we're most connected to and how they are policing kids of color, queer kids, specifically black girls, um, and Latinx girls in different ways because of who they are and how they're showing up, but also because of, of what they might be experiencing in their lives. You know, what, um, I'll, I'll stop there because I could go on, but yeah, I think we need to, to be accountable in our own lives and within the institutions that we are connected to every day. I would just add one last thought to everything everyone said, and that would just be, you know, when you see girls, because I see them every single day, whether it's going to the store, um, whether it is when I used to, when we, I guess, used to take the bus or the subway, some of us do, um, when we're in the park, you see young girls often, uh, you can look at them, you can see that there's struggle, there's pain, there's trauma, stop them and speak to them. If there's someone who's in your church and one of your community organizations in your building, stop them and speak to them. You'd be um, surprised how long a conversation goes, asking somebody if they're okay, putting a smile um, on your face to them. Because girls um, are often alone. And, you know, so often we think we have to do all these big things and just saying, hello, how are you? Is there anything I can do to support you? Um, goes a long way. I'll add one little quick thing broadly. I, I wish, and, you know, because apparently, you know, this is like the panel for the incorrigible girls, the misbehaved ones. I'm going to just live into that a little bit this evening. Um, if we could extend the grace that we were, like, willing to extend uh, to white men, you know, to men who create, who do sometimes very horrible things to youth of color, if we're able to look at them and say, they had a bad day, and this is what they did. Um, I think that that just even just that ability to see them as human beings, as people who are having a hard time um, and, and who could maybe use that grace um, is, is something that um, I wish we could see. And I think that could be useful, that uh, humanity. Thank you. That was great. I think um, heading toward our closure because it, this has gone so quickly the time here and there's so much more that we could we could talk about but I also I know Topeka's waiting for her plane and and um, we're, there's there's um, we're going to be kind of doing a little wrap up but um, I just if someone said Shonda you rock yes <laughs> you all rock um, the uh, in we were um, had a question just if 
to, if anyone in the audience wanted to kind of chime in on the on the question, what does incorrigible mean to you? It's kind of an ongoing question that we're that we ask people to kind of have um, people kind of uh, present their interpretation of the word. And some people want to, you know, give the the definition. Um, you know, from Webster's and others are doing the reclamation. So um, the other thing you could add in the chat is what is your message for girls? Um, and, and I really liked what Topeka had to say about just speaking to, to girls, you know, and seeing them. Um, I know that's just so important. And, and that's something that, um, that Lillian, one of the women that was at the training school was talk, t has told me time and time again about how you can see very often in, in girls' eyes that there's something that's there and it's really important to address it and just not let them walk by if, if, if you can. Um, so anyway, we'd love for you to, um, to um, add your thoughts in the chat. And, um, and I don't know if, if um, Pauline, if you would like to do a, a wrap up or talk about upcoming events at Doris, the one thing that I did want to shout out about and, um, and, and Pauline had mentioned at the beginning was the, the Child Victims Act and the look back window deadline that's coming up, which ends on August 14th um, for anyone who wants, who would be able to file a civil suit uh, against their abuser if they were abused as a child or an institution that should have protected them because the once that window closes you know there's a, a, many many people of a certain age will, will not be able to, um, to 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 do that so that's something that I want to continually talk about for the next five months until the window closes <clears throat> but I really want to thank you all for the work that you're doing and for taking the time to be here as well as everyone in the audience. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to kind of hand it over to, to Raul or Pauline to, to kind of um, wrap us up. Um, one last thing, if, if any of you have any last thoughts that you have a burning desire to share, please, please jump in. But, um, but I know you've said so much and it's, it's been really great to have you here. I just want to say thank you again um, for creating the space and for doing the work that you do. It's so incredibly important and it's so affirming, Allison, um, sort of have not having been at the school for girls, but have, had, having had similar experiences. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be seen and heard and uh, to be in fellowship with people that I sort of deeply respect and admire. Um, it's, it's been wonderful to be in conversation with you all and to see all of your faces. Um, although, like, I'm looking at Topeka in the airport, and I'm like, is this how we look on a Thursday? I, do I need to get my life together? <laughs> you know, Gladys is over there looking all glowing and moisturized and beautiful. <laughs> I'm like, apparently, I got to get off this call and go do some self-care and some healing or something. <laughs> wonderful. Um, so, just thank you again. Yeah. I just want to thank all of the panelists. I mean, I think the work that you're doing is amazing. It just validates why doing this work is so important. And all of you are incredible models, role models for young, for young women. And, you know, sometimes doing this work is so hard and it's a struggle. And the fact that you are all in and have been doing this and making a difference is so important. So I just wanna thank you for that. It matters. And I also want to say thank you. Thank you to Allison because of, I think the history that you're telling is so important. And I know that it inspires change today for people to understand their work as rooted in this story that you're telling. Thank you to the panelists for your leadership. I've admired all of you for a long time and always learn every time I get to hear from you. But also I know there are so many people on this call who are connected to the Incorrigibles project and who shared their expertise and life stories and so much more to making the Incorrigibles project possible. And I'm just so grateful to you for your leadership and for sharing everything that you have with us, but also with the world and letting us learn from you. So thank you. Hi. I'll wrap it up with a thank you. Thank you all. I appreciate it.
Thank you for your patience with me in the airport. I also wanted to say to everyone, thank you for participating. The panelists were absolutely fabulous. But there's one thing everyone can do tomorrow or even tonight, which is to write Governor Cuomo an email about that piece of legislation that Allison mentioned that would take incorrigible out of the state law. Because quite frankly, some things that seem so obvious to us, like, of course, that's a no-brainer. You're going to sign it. It might not happen. But all of us can help make it happen to show that people are paying attention and that we care. So that's a very simple thing. I hope people do do that. Um, and uh, I'm just thrilled that the Department of Records and Information Service is able to make connections that are real uh, using historical matters and bringing it into, into today's world. Thanks to all of you. So um, thanks again. Thank you so much for your participation, your time, and for sharing your knowledge, and your vision, and your tools uh, about this wonderful topic. Um, I'm wondering if Latonia would like to say something before we end the event. Hi, I would. Um, hi, for those who don't know, I'm Latonia Jones, I'm Director of External Affairs at Doris. Um, one thing I'd like to mention is that this um, event is in partnership with a project at our agency called Women's Activism.NYC. And the point of this um, project is to preserve stories of women from across the world to inspire us, everyday extraordinary women. Um, we call on people to add the stories of their mother, their grandmother, their teacher, their mentor, any woman that has made a difference in their life. Um, and so, and also to share a story about themselves, to see themselves as an inspiration um, that needs to be preserved in the archives for the next few hundred years. So I will ask Raul to add that link in the, in the chat so you can all share a story, um, share a story um, ahead of Mother's Day, give it as a gift to your mom. Um, I hope to have the courage to one day try to encompass my mother's story on the site. Um, I recently added my aunt who we lost last year and it was quite challenging, but I am so glad that she and her story will be preserved in the archives. So um, I would ask call on all of you to do the same. Yes. Great. Thank, thank you so much, Ella, for sharing your voice and your um, song. Uh, and I we wish you the best uh, for your career. Uh, Topika, thank you so much. Gladys, thank you so much. Shwanda, thank you so much. And Alison, it's been a pleasure working with you. Thank you so much. Have a great night.